How accurate subdivision is played has a great effect. So whether a triplet is really a triplet or a 16th note is really even, or you phrase it a bit differently, in my experience, everyone seems to have their own version of phrasing those things. Very seldom people really play them as exact as they could be. And that is not a bad thing in itself and can even create a certain vibe or groove. And if it does, great. But you can also have problems where there are different ways of phrasing and I want to demonstrate that for you. For this, my good friend Frank It on bass will help me to demonstrate this. What we will do now is to take the 4 E and Da, so the last 16th note of a bar. We'll do it in bar 2. I'll open the hi-hat as well to make it more clear. And we will demonstrate how we can place it a bit earlier, a bit later. Let's see if you can hear the difference. First, we'll both play right on so it lines up with the 16th note subdivision. Now we'll pull that last 16th note a bit forward, play it earlier than it normally would be in the grid. But when we do it together, it works. Listen if you can hear the difference to the first one. It feels more urgent now. Now we will pull it back a bit, play it later, so to speak. This probably feels a bit heavier, more laid back. So now that you heard those three variations, you might say, no big deal. It's maybe a bit different, but it didn't sound wrong. And it's okay if you even didn't hear that much of a difference, but that's exactly my point. It shows how important it is to play together, and on the positive side, how forgiving it can be if only the perception of those placements are the same between everyone in the band no matter if it's in line or perfect with the click. So what sounds right and what doesn't often is a matter of democracy. But what happens if we have different ways of phrasing it? Ready? Let's have some fun. Now we will do the exact same thing, but only I will play the late version and Frank will play the early version. Let's go. Now we'll do it the other way around. I'll play the early version and Frank will play the late version. Wow, huh? I think it's now clear that if we have different conceptions and expectations of how things should be phrased, it can be quite severe. That's why it's good to be able to make those adjustments consciously and accurately and to have a great awareness of subdivision. Like with everything else, if all is okay, it's okay. 
But when you bump into a problem like this, it's really good to have the ability to diagnose what it is that makes everything fall apart or sound weird, and then be able to adjust, in this case, your subdivision. Subdivision has a great effect on how urgent or relaxed patterns or just a fill or even just a part of a fill can feel to us. Another very practical example is this. The swing ride cymbal pattern is traditionally played with triplet subdivision, although you can find it notated in eighth notes as well as triplets. How it is phrased by the player is part of the personality of the drummer or the tune he plays. Here I want to give you the chance to hear the full spectrum once, from swung to triplet to wide open eighth notes to very close almost sixteenth note subdivision. Now we'll use it to give the fill a different effect. First I'll play in triplets like the groove, then I will use sixteenth in the fill. And then I'll mix it together. By switching triplet and straight subdivision within the fill, I call this the handbrake. And I love it. You will feel this tempering with the subdivision there. It almost feels like I'm messing with the tempo, but it stays the same. It's just subdivision. Check it out. This is a big mystery to many, and I've never seen a really accurate demonstration for it. So let me give it my best shot. Many musicians still confuse in front of the beat with getting faster, or playing behind the beat or laid back with playing slower in regards to tempo. It's very important here to separate this subject from the tempo, because it's not about tempo. It's really more a phenomenon about displacing a whole pattern or single beats in relation to something else, which could be a click or the rest of the music, or when you just lay back the snare a bit, displace that a bit slightly to the bass drum or hi-hat. Whenever I heard demonstrations of that, it was often done without a click, which can be very confusing because playing a beat just two beats faster can almost have the similar effect at first. But when we really talk about leaning forward a bit or leaning backwards, we're not talking about changing the tempo. The first time I really got it was when I saw a hip hop artist fool around with sampled beats. He moved loops around slightly in time and by that the field changed miraculously without changing the tempo. 
I want to give you the same experience. That's why we'll take the guesswork out of it and let the machine do the demo. So you can be sure we only change what I say we change, nothing else. First of all, listen to this groove. This will be right on, quantized. So again, Without changing what is played, we will just take the whole drum beat and move it forward a bit in relation to the click slightly and see if you can hear the difference. Got it? Now let's listen to the laid back version. Now we we'll listen to all three. Were you able to hear the difference? I overdid the examples a bit. These are too drastic maybe, but I wanted to make it obvious because I wanted you to really hear what it does, what effect it has emotionally with the feel, just for demonstration's sake. You might say, I don't like this or that version, which is fine, because then your aesthetic was at play. And this is exactly what you will need when playing and placing your grooves within the context of the music. Lastly, let's look at one other way of doing it, which is just fooling around with the separate voices of the drum beat. Just change the snare drum placement by pulling it back a bit. Listen to this. Okay, wasn't that interesting? Although this is quite an advanced concept of time playing, I wanted you to really hear it and have a clear reference point for what it can do. Now, put on a click or a shaker or a play along, something that will serve as a simple reference point for you time-wise. And now try to make three recordings. First, play on top of it. Try to line up exactly with the click. And then, when you were able to do that, try to do other versions, at least two. A laid back version and a more in front of urgent version. This can take a while, but really try to get it to a point where there is a hearable difference or better, a feelable difference that still doesn't sound weird. Caution, be careful here. It's easy to overdo and to overthink this. Please. Don't create a monster here and totally mess up your time playing with something you can do and when you do it has to be a quite subtle thing. Also in the end, I think it has to be intuitive. Please don't overthink this. I guess my hero Steve Gadd once put it best in an interview and I hope I quote it correctly here. He was asked, Steve, what is your approach, your style of playing grooves? Are you more a laid back kind of guy or do you play more on or... What are your thoughts on that? And he said, 
I always play on, on the feel of the song. I absolutely love that. So that concludes our time chapter for now. Remember, these are important elements that are at play and are tools that you can use, but compared to the following chapters, you'll find that they're maybe less important than we drummers always think. <laughs> I hope it became clear that there is so much more going on than just playing perfectly to a click. It's always a matter of what the result is, what it really does to the listener. Ultimately, I mean, music is really about what feels great, which is what the next chapter is really about.
I know. In the midst of our usual study, like practicing paradiddles on a pad, checking out cool fills or licks, it's easy to forget that this is really what we want to create with it, right? This is the result we're after, this gut-level feeling of, wow, this feels good, this grooves. This is what it's all about. And aren't you sometimes amazed that drummers with great technique don't move you that much? Sometimes drummers with poor technique can play something that feels and fits great. And sometimes even if the tempo is not perfect and the subdivision is kind of funky, groove can transcend those guidelines if you know where it comes from. So what is groove and where does it come from? Groove is that emotional connection that we feel when a song or instrument makes us want to move, not our head or our feet or whatever body part. It's a certain power that grabs us, that makes us feel a particular way. But where does it come from? See, we as human beings develop through evolution a clear sense of what's important to us and what's not. One thing crucial to our survival was to judge quickly emotional states of a fellow creatures. Does he look happy, relaxed, or in a mood where he's likely to attack? Or just to judge which kind of living being is in front of us? Or whether that's a living being at all? Does it breathe? Does it move? We became masters that can scan our surroundings for hints in that direction and respond to it emotionally. An outgrowth of that is that when we see a curtain with wrinkles that throw shadows, our brain sees faces in them. Or when we look at clouds, and we see faces or recognize other shapes that we want to see. Our brain loves pattern recognition and organizing and takes every opportunity to interpret the information around us along those lines. And it's highly emotional. Why can someone with a mask that suddenly appears make you scream and scare you? It's because of that. And we feel a different connection to living beings than to lifeless objects. We have an innate desire to feel connection to living things and feel connected to something. This sensation of warmth and connection and safety is what is at the core of that great feeling we have when something is really groovy. Is it not the case that you have warm feelings more towards another human being or a cat than to a metal rod? <laughs> Why is that the case? The difference between the metal rod and a living creature is, well, life. And what do all living creatures have in common? A certain rhythm of breathing in and out. Or of course, the heartbeat. It's the first thing we hear in our life. Our hearing is fully developed long before we can see giving us safety and certainty that we're not alone. If a heart skips and becomes faster or slower, we have a problem and it's life-threatening. It has to be in a certain consistency and rhythm to provide life. It's the same with breathing. Now the good news is, if your drum part skips or becomes irregular faster and slower, the consequences might not be as severe, but the discomfort it creates to the listener is emotionally connected to that, at least to some degree. To have these things in flow, in a certain repetition, gives us a feeling of comfort that everything is as it should be. A little story. When my son was one and a half years old, I carried him in my arm and took him for a walk in a park at a sunny day. He and I just looked around at things and there were some people having a picnic. There were a couple of blankets and pillows on the ground and in between, there was a cat. First, I didn't see it because it looked like one of the blankets as well. We both looked at it and my son didn't show much emotional reaction. But then you could see the cat's belly go up and down, up and down, because it was breathing in and out. Suddenly he smiled. I didn't realize why at first, but it was because he had this emotional connection. Ah, this is something living. The other blankets were also soft and had the same color and looked the same, but this was a living being. I really think this is at the core of what we do with tension and release, downbeat, upbeat, sound, silence, to create something that has life, is lifelike. You wouldn't have a groove without these qualities in place. 
That brings us to when we want to create this emotional connection to the audience or the other musicians, we will need that give and take, breathing in and out, tension and release. We will need that. Now, what does that mean in a practical sense? I spoke in the time chapter about what machines are very good at. Accuracy, calculating, all those kind of things. But this give and take, feeling, this tension and release, machines have no ability whatsoever. Machines are horrible at that. That's what we are good at. For example, if we use this metronome, let's have it play perfect time and perfect subdivision. So if you think that that is all that groove is, listen to this and try to nod your head or move to this. Will this make you want to dance? Let's listen to it. There is evenness and consistency, but in a groove sense, there's nothing there, right? If you would play that between two songs in a dance club or concert, and people would stop dancing and look at you in a weird or disappointed way, and the owner would fire you probably as a DJ. <laughs> but the question is, what makes a phrase? What makes that repetition cycle, this give and take kind of emotion? How can we get there? Check this out. Does that not create a different feel? You're able to move to that. I mean, don't get me wrong. This is not a beautiful ballad that lets your heart melt. But I think you can get the idea of how a phrase begins to evolve and this cycle feeling begins to appear with it. You know where the downbeat is here. You know which is the pulse. These are the things we need to create that emotion. We not only need that time or subdivision, we need that pulse, that phrase. We need tension and release and repetition. So again, how did we get it in this example? Through important and unimportant notes, through dynamics, through loud and soft. By that, we have space between the important notes. These are the parameters we need to create this. Another thing I want to touch on is why does playing in front of the beat or behind the beat create different emotions? We talked earlier about when a machine calculates perfect tempo, so the spaces in between, the impulses are all the same, that creates not only that it doesn't get slower or faster, but that certain sense of consistency, that the beats always come where you expect them to come. You always hear that impulse when you expect it to be there that creates a certain kind of trust. Trust is an emotion. Consistency and trust is there when you don't have to worry about something. You know it is there, which makes it reliable. But also like wallpaper, it doesn't jump out at you. It can disappear a bit. You don't have to worry about it. This is an important emotion we drummers also have to be able to convey, to maybe not go into the forefront, but to be in a supporting role so that no one has to worry about what we do. We're just there to support the music and to be reliable. What happens if you fool around with that? 
We talked about what actually happens with the notes in the time chapter. In this emotional or field chapter, let's see what that really creates and where I think it comes from. Let's think about this. You have an appointment with a good friend of yours. You say you meet at two o'clock. So you're at home, expect him to come at two o'clock. You get a short message saying, sorry, man, I'll be 30 minutes late. So maybe you were running around and getting your things together, packing everything because you wanted to go out and do this and that. Then you see, ah, oh, I have more time than I thought. Oh, I can relax. He comes later than expected. If you're not angry at him, <laughs> you get more relaxed because you have more time than you thought. It's that feeling of, I did expect it there, but it's a bit later. I think that's the emotion that comes, the, the heaviness, the relaxation from placing the backbeat a little bit behind. It comes a little bit later than you would unconsciously expect it to be. It doesn't have to be conscious. It's an emotional thing. You expect that snare drum to hit, but it comes a bit late. So it's kind of lazy, relaxing and heavy. So playing in front of the beat is the opposite. Let's say you have an appointment at two o'clock, your friend should come over and you're doing your stuff preparing, but then at 1.30, the bell rings and he comes in. It's like, whoa, I didn't expect you early. Maybe you're a little bit stressed because you didn't expect him. You expected to have more time for yourself. This is the emotion that I think is created by playing in front of the beat. You didn't expect the beat, so it almost surprises you. It's always a bit earlier than you would unconsciously think. So on that emotional level, these are the phenomena that we create when we play around with time. And I think it's nice to be aware of them at least once to know that we can really manipulate these things. I find it remarkable that we as drummers have that much power. <laughs> and with power comes responsibility to shape the feel of the song. The exercise for this would be to simply try it out both with and without the click. And again, analyze your recordings in respect to that. Is it more exciting or more relaxing the way you play? Can you do it without manipulating the tempo? Also listen to recordings of your band or rehearsals or you playing a beat for five or six minutes. Really see whether you can do anything better in regards to creating a phrase, creating tension and release, creating repetition to really make the most out of your groove, to really create that feel of this heartbeat or a pendulum going left and right. Do you see any of that when you play? Can you feel that? Or are there too many notes or too many fills that feel like a heart that skips? Bottom line is be aware of the emotional effect things have that you do on your instrument. Go away from the what you play and focus on how you play it and how that makes it feel. Sometimes the what you play will have a different how it feels effect that you may have thought. I want you to shift your focus and analysis and priorities and practicing towards the effect you create with what you do. And I can't say it often enough, the best way to do it is to record yourself and compare different approaches. Then I want you to adjust what you play to your aesthetic and your newfound realizations. Have fun. People always say about the drum set that it's a very loud instrument. Haven't you heard that before too? Drums are a loud instrument. All right, let's have a listen. Hmm, I can't hear anything. Weird. So I think it must be the player who produces the sound and the volume. Listen, I know it's hard, especially for us drummers, but what if we take full responsibility for what we create here in terms of sound? And this is much more than just volume. As soon as you embrace that and don't only leave it to your hands, you have much more tools available to shape the impact of your groove playing. Why? Think about it. What is our vehicle to create all this emotion and to create those subdivisions we talked about? 
It's of course the sound that we produce. That is our medium to get across all we talked about and will talk about on this DVD. So let's start from nothing. What is not being played is equally as important as what is being played. Arrest is not nothing. Arrest is silence. That's a big difference. I'll say it again. Arrest is just silence. It's not nothing. If you treat it like nothing, you will not get all the benefits from the subdivision, the spacing, and the awareness of the phrases that we learned so far. Frankly, without space, there isn't any subdivision. <laughs> The fact that there is no sound does not mean there is no music. To the contrary, it's an important part of it. This is crucial, especially with respect to groove. Let's apply this to fills. A rest is not nothing. It can give things next to it more value. Like Victor Wooden says in his book, Music Lesson, it's like you think in mathematics that zero is just nothing. You could say that. But if you place a zero after a one, it changes the value of the one, right? It's a 10 then. Your rest is your zero. I think it's a very effective weapon that we can use sound-wise. I'll play two versions of a fill. First time, I'll fill the bar before up with something. Second time, I'll leave space. Didn't that space make the film more important, put it on a pedestal? It does create time, but also contrast. But back to the time aspect. If you find it challenging to play super slow tempos, this next exercise may solve it for you within minutes. Check it out.